Good evening, uh, colleagues, friends, students. Uh, I am Dean Abhi Mukherjee of the College of Business. I'm delighted to welcome our guests tonight and uh, our, our speaker for the Spring Distinguished Dean Speaker Series, Mr. Ed Baker. Uh, Ed is known all over Atlanta. He's a celebrity in Atlanta. I, I watch him every Sunday at 11 o'clock, and I try to watch him all on, the, on that program. At 11 o'clock at, at 11 Alive on the NBC channel, he does a business program where he interviews you know, business celebrities and so on. You really need to watch that program if, if you already don't. Uh, he is the publisher of the Atlanta Business Chronicle, which is one of the most powerful business magazines not only in the city of Atlanta, but across the country. Uh, Ed sits on several boards uh, of various companies. I'll just read out a few. He told me to be very No, brief. no, you don't need to read them. Right. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Good evening. <laughs> Thank you, Avi. Give me a hand. You did a great job, and I thank you. Short, sweet, to the point. Anybody have any questions? No questions? Well, you have a question. Go ahead, let's do it. Uh, could you describe business climate in the Atlanta area? Topic number one. We did, I don't know this one. What does that say? Hot Atlanta, right? Hot Atlanta. Hot Atlanta. I'm going to talk about Hot Atlanta. We'll start there. Thank you. We've never met. You didn't pay me for that. I didn't. Pay you. We didn't trans Before I answer that question, I, I one want to welcome you. We're gonna have a good time. I promise you that. Two is Georgia State won today. I'm so excited. Yeah. And I, I'm not one of those Fairweather fans. I have season tickets, so understand. I'm, I've been there. I've experienced that experience. But most importantly, come on in. The weather's fine. No rain. Um, most importantly, I've been asked this question by about four or five of the folks here today. You know, what do you know about Clayton State? Have you been down here before? And you know, the usual, because typically they get people who hadn't been down here and don't know this campus and don't know this part of town. Well, that's not the case with me, okay? Because the truth of the matter is, in the year 1970. I kissed my girlfriend for the first time in Lake Spivey. Oh. She's my wife of 40 years. She was 15, I was 16. So do I know this part of town? Yeah. You better believe I know this part of town. So it's always fun to come down here. It really, it really is. And, and I love what you're doing down here, so we'll get there. So you ready? The economy, which is a wonderful opportunity for all you students. Okay, and I really want to focus respectfully more on the young folks in the room tonight than the ones that look closer to my demographic. Okay, so I need, I need the, the beaming in of all the students here tonight because I'm going to tell some stories. I'm going to set you up, and I think I'm going to make you happy because Hot Atlanta is back. And for those of you who were not born when Hot Atlanta arrived, if you will, it was about 20 years ago, and Atlanta could do no wrong. Uh, the Olympics came to town, new airport was popping up, companies are moving here left and right. It was, it was just a wonderful, wonderful economy along the way, uh, and everything was grand and glorious. A modern day reincarnation, in my opinion, of Hotlanta is now happening in town. And if you string it all together, you can see that, that this is not make-believe. Let's start with, we've got not one but two new stadiums being built in Atlanta at this time. And at the end of the day, a lot of it's all about getting a job and getting a good job. So when you've got facilities like that that are coming up that only, not only employ, but you're talking about tax space, you're talking about other activities coming to town and creating more jobs on top of it, that's a very big deal. If you look pretty much anywhere around town, you see new building, you see cranes, you see ha price of housing starting to really go up. Banks are not failing anymore. They're lending money again. Um, so in terms of the general overall economy, things are in pretty good shape. There's certain industries that are, are booming. Uh, the hospitality industry is booming. They've got not only business this year, but business on the books for the next three years uh, that really put us like almost at a sold out position. Uh, we're looking at bringing a Super Bowl to town when that new stadium is built. The problem we have is there are too many conventions coming to town to book a year for the Super Bowl 
because there are no hotel rooms for the Super Bowl. It's a great problem to have, supply and demand moving forward. So the hospitality industry books four and five and six years out for lots of big conventions, which obviously have a large attachment to employees and more hotels are even being built in town. A new one by the stadium, but really by both stadiums. The Falcons will have a, a new hotel by the World Congress Center and the Braves in their move will have a big hotel out there. So for those young folks in the room that are interested in the hospitality industry, it's going to continue to grow. They're going to continue to be more opportunities. Much the same in other industries like uh, the movie business, the movie and entertainment business. And it's not just making movies in town and that's way cool and it's not all about The Walking Dead, but you've got movies going on here in a big way. You've got television shows being produced here in a big way, especially for those who watch Bounce as an example, an Atlanta-based company, if you will, to all the way down the line to gaming. Gaming is a huge deal to the far end of the spectrum and you deal with apps. Uh, a lot of app development going on and a lot of app development going on in town. The other part of why Hotlanta is becoming Hotlanta are startups and entrepreneurship. It's a real big deal and I will tell you straight away that, that half of you students in this room, in any given classroom, have some interest in entrepreneurship. The question is which one of you has the interest in it and who has declared that interest in it because you're on a different track if you will, if that's what you want to do and you want to own or run your own business or you want to do your own thing and, and that's happening and that's never really happened before. And the realities of, of entrepreneurial business is going to be a very big deal and I don't know how much conversations taking place down here but if you want to look at it globally first, because you got to look at the whole world now, you can't just look at what's happening in Jonesboro, it doesn't work that way anymore. Okay? But globally, the number of entrepreneurs will double in the next five years in this world, as will the number of middle market people, i.e. the mid-markets jumping up and entrepreneurship is jumping up and future opportunity is all over the place. Why is this happening? Well, you know, one big reason is access to capital. The average startup of a business in the United States now is $25,000. $25,000 is the average of a startup. So is $25,000 a big deal? Well, for some it is, but you know what? You get 10 people to come together at $2,500 a piece, there's your startup business. Whether it's crowdfunding, whether it's money from family, whether it's angel investing, whether it's your credit card, a lot of people are looking kind of to do their own thing. And that's a change in the way people do business and the way they operate. And there are a lot of facilities, if you will, around town now that are built for startups. There's a, a startup village in Buckhead called Atlanta Tech Village. They've got about 300 young people in there with a whole bunch of different ideas going on, all looking to make it big, if you will. And as one moves out, another one moves in. There's another one attached to Georgia Tech. There's another one uh, in downtown off of Marietta Street with these villages where young people are gathering, where they're comparing notes, where they're partnering, where they're looking at new ideas, how they're reinventing the world. A lot of dreams are being realized, but it's not for everybody because there's risk involved. Risk reward along the way, you know, is part of that conversation for you. Um, I sit in this really unusual place. I've been at the Business Chronicle for 29 years. I'm an entrepreneur. I run an entrepreneurial business. I run a family business, I run a very successful business because of the quality of the employees that, that work for me and the quality of the product we produce. And the other side of it is I hear from all these businesses around town because we cover them and what are they saying about you? What are they, t what are they saying about millennials? And, and where is this all going? Well, I will tell you that I teach at Mercer, okay? Um, I teach a graduate class in life skills and soft skills, if you will. So I spend a lot of time with young people. My energy comes from young people. It doesn't come from people my age, okay? I understand you, okay? Not just because I teach you, and that's not to say that every professor understands you, okay? But I went back to school two years ago to get my master's degree at the tender age of 60, okay? <laughs> I did it for a number of reasons. One is to send a message to myself, and that is that bucket list thing, 
Either you deal with it or you don't. Does everyone know what a bucket list is? Okay. So as you get older, the bucket list becomes more important before you kick the bucket. Okay. So up at the top of my list was graduate school. I have been blessed that I come from a long line of very highly educated people, but I felt inferior that I wanted a master's degree, that I believed in lifelong learning. So I went back to school. I went back to Georgia State. I enrolled with 24, 25 year olds. Okay? And did it for a few reasons. One was the bucket list. Two is I wanted to see if an old man could go with the young folks. Because I don't know anyone who's challenged the brain power of an old person versus a young person. Well, guess what? The old guy can still go. 3.93, I got my master's degree. Okay? There's not a young one in the room that I can't get in the ring with. I proved it. Okay? Forevermore, you can't take that away from me. And equally importantly is I really got to get down with millennials and to understand you at the work level. Not it, I'm older and I'm here and you're there, but I was at that table, it was a cohort group program. I did every bit of the work that they did. Frankly, I did a little more work than they did. And I learned a lot. I learned a lot about you. Uh, one is, you're smart as hell, excuse me. <laughs> it's the smartest group I've ever come across. Okay, you need to know that. The however is, you're all smart, okay? And when it gets down to getting a job in the real world, am I hiring you? Or am I hiring you? And that's a choice that I get to make. So the questions then become, how are you going to differentiate yourself? How are you going to be pulled out of that pack? And how are you going to be the one? If you want to be the one. You may not want to be the one. Okay, but for those of you who want to be the one, you're going to have to differentiate yourself. And what's going to make you different and make you better than the other smart young person sitting right next to you and I will tell you the first stopping point is learn to write. Write, write, write. Work on your writing skills at the very top of the list. Because I will tell you straight away, business on people who can communicate. And if you can't write, and I'm not talking about cryptic writing now, okay, well, no code. Well, not business doesn't deal in code, okay? But if you really want to get your proper education, and if you really want to take on the world, I would absolutely work on my writing skills across the board. Two is presentation skills. Can you talk to people? Because if you're going to be the quiet one in the back of the room, you know what, 30 years later, you're going to be the quiet one in the back of the room. Period. If you don't speak up, and you don't have a point of view, then all you are is a board. And we're going nowhere fast. And the more time I spend with my friendly millennials, the more I come to the realization that you want the same things as the other generations. You really are no different. Okay? I'm not buying that millennials are this group of young people that came from another planet. Okay? And a lot of companies are painting you that way. And it's wrong. We had a long conversation before this gathering tonight with with your fine educators here on that very topic. Okay? They don't know you, you don't know them. Okay? If you want to get a real job, you're going to have to build a relationship with these people. If you think you can do it from a distance, it ain't going to work. Okay? I can go on and on for the next two hours on this topic, but I'm going to stop right here and right now, and especially from the young folks, do you have any questions so far about what I have just said? Okay, give you another part. So, I'm going to give you examples of, of differentiation. And, and I'm going um, to do it in a couple of ways that hopefully will strike home. So I teach this class at Mercer. I have 37 students. This is real world. Okay? The majority of them are master students. And I asked them to fill out a survey. I gave them three weeks to fill it out. Five questions. Okay? Gave them a date, due date of March the 9th. 17 of the 37 made the deadline. 20 of the 37 did not make the deadline. Don't be one of the 20. Make your deadlines. Understand 
Business operates in a deadline world even if you don't. Okay, get on with it. Because it will take you down faster than not understanding what time management is. You may want to write that one down too. Where are you on the management of your time? You are given a rap that you don't want to plan. Everything is spontaneous. I get it. Everything can't be spontaneous. You can pick your spots and it could be 80% of your world, but you can't be spontaneous on everything. Business will not accept your decision on spontaneity. Okay? So you got to make your deadlines. It's a very big deal along the way. But at the end of the day, when all is said and done, what is this all about? It's about getting a good job and living happily ever after. Anyone want to disagree with that? So how are you going to make that happen? How are you going to make that happen? And it's not sitting and waiting for someone to respond to the digital application you sent in. You're not going to get a response. Okay? Don't expect that that's the way you're going to find your, your next opportunity. It starts with relationships and it starts with using your good brain and it starts with understanding that you're going to be paid to solve problems. Okay? So you might as well begin the problem solving now. So I would challenge you, how many of you have had internships? How many of you have had more than one internship? I think you walk out with a degree with at least three internships. Because that's going to make you way different than the other 49 young people that want that same job. You've got to challenge your own thinking along the way. You've got to understand that you're going to continually learn about yourself as you go and as you grow in all the situations that you're going to be in. And no, the average time spent is going to be 3.4 years per job. But that's not to say that you can't go and work for a company and stay there long term. That is, I also think, a shame that there's a belief that you have to change jobs every three to four years or else you're not successful. I don't believe that. I don't buy that program. I believe you can continue to grow within a company until such time as you're not challenged anymore or you've grown to the point where you want to start your own business or someone came knocking on your door and, and gave you a bigger and better opportunity along the way. I think that's a big part of it. The part that concerns me and put this in your head is the issue of leadership. If you really got it and you're blessed with work skills and work ethic and, and really want to go after it, uh, the question would then be, do you want to be a worker, a manager, or a leader? And I think you fall into three buckets. And everyone's not made for every bucket. Some are just great workers and that's just the way it's going to be. Some want to manage people and, and revel in that, but they don't want to be the leader of the pack. I worry about the leadership piece. And I worry about it from the standpoint of how many, what percentage of you want to step up and be leaders along the way. And even in the community. Okay, because I don't see a lot of involvement and engagement in young people in the community. The group that's uh, 10 years older than you are right now. Okay? I'm not seeing them getting community active, getting involved in leadership programs, getting involved in junior achievement, getting involved in their church, getting involved. It's, it's looking like silos to me. So I would offer to you that if you have leadership skills and orientation, that you continue to grow them and nurture them and understand that's going to be a big winner for those of you who have got it and really want to head in that direction. But that's a personal choice. It really is. Some, it's, we're all wired differently. All of us are. You know, and it's amazing to me how we continue to, to run businesses and operate companies. And there are a lot of companies that are um, very poorly run. Okay? And a lot of them land up going out of business. So when you do get to the point of that interview, you're interviewing them as much as they're interviewing you. Because if it's not the right place, it doesn't feel right, and the culture's not right, you're interviewing, they're interviewing, it's time to come to the reality that is that going to help you grow and get to where you want to be? Or should you just stay out in the market? Because here's the big one. Okay, here's the big one for you. The demographic shift is happening as we speak. There are now more millennials in the workforce than baby boomers. It just made the turn. 
okay? Baby boomers are turning 70 years old this year. It's the big number. So the big number is moving toward retirement, and you're the group that sits behind that giant number that's retiring. So your opportunity in four to five years is gonna be enormous because supply and demand are gonna line up way different than they have before. You're gonna have lots of opportunity based on, I think my battery died. Um, you're gonna have lots of opportunity based on the fact that companies are really understanding now more than ever that millennials or my workforce of the future, my workforce is not three years away. My workforce is today, tomorrow, next year, and the percentages are gonna go up dramatically when you hit really 2020 in Atlanta, in the United States, and around the world. Big shift. So the question becomes, okay, fast forward for yourself five years out and work backwards. What do you want to be when you grow up? What do you want to be? Because the sky's the limit for you. And I would challenge you to look at things like you've never looked at them before and look at all of your options. If I were young again, I'm mentally, I'm a millennial. Okay. <laughs> Physically, I'm not there. But we can go culture. If we want to do culture tonight, I can go with you. Okay? But I'm telling you that I would look at the cool things in this world. You know, social media is not going away. Okay? How versed are you that? Is that a business you may want to go into? Is that something you may want to go work for? Cloud computing is not going away. 3D printing is not going away. Drone technology is not going away. So it doesn't have to be traditional. It doesn't have to be because it's here now, it won't be there. Apps are not going away. They'll be modified and used differently and widgets will be a different conversation, but technology is certainly not going away. And the need for the quality employee is going to become a bigger demand. So your future is bright. You will be able to pay off these loans. Okay? You will. It's, it's happening now. The economy is improving. Back to the first question. There are jobs in this market like they haven't been in seven years. That is not going to change in the next three to four years. So your timing is good. Had this been six, seven years ago, I'd have been in this room singing the blues with you. Okay? Because it wasn't like this. It was going in the tank. It's how many layoffs are we going to have to report today, this week, this month, this year? No one's talking layoffs anymore. Things are not closing anymore. Bankruptcy numbers are way down. Income is going up. So you're in a good position. You're in a real good position. So I'm going to stop right there again and see if you got any questions. Or you want to take this conversation in a different direction. And I know you're all smart, so I'm looking for real good questions. Yes, ma'am. If, you got, if you're in a second full-time job, you're way past. You're there. It's the experience piece. People want people that have had experiences, people that are energetic to the point of having gone out there while they were going to school and worked. The ones that just went to school and hung out at the beach are going to be looked at differently. But if you've got solid, rock-solid work experience, that's the best of all worlds. That shows that you can multitask. It shows that you're hungry. It shows you're energetic. And that if it's in a business that you have experience in, chances are you're going to be desirous by many other people along the way as well. There's a question up here somewhere. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I uh, want to take you back to the hotland career emergence, if you will. And uh, as far as business growth in Atlanta is concerned, how is that impacting the obvious problems we have with transportation network here in the city? Is our, our growth is not helping transportation at this point. Um, let, me, let, me, let me go through the whole thing with you, okay? Oh, Lord. <laughs> First of all, I, oh, the microphone's gone. No. You want this mic? Okay, so here's the deal. 
Let me tell you about transportation. I think we've done this to ourselves. I, I think we've, we, we put a, a voodoo on ourselves. Okay? How many of you are from big cities? Is there traffic in the big cities? Yeah. Name me a big city that doesn't have traffic. You can't name me one. But we love to beat ourselves into the ground on this traffic thing. This is a big city. Okay? It's going to become a bigger city. Okay? If you don't want to live in a big city, go move to Asheville. Yeah. It's, it's a small city. Okay? It's the price you pay in this world, not just in the United States, for living in a big city. Okay? You are blessed in Clayton County that you got Marduk finally coming, which should have happened 30 years ago. That's a conversation for another day. Okay? The reality is, in your lifetime, we are not going to fix our transportation, quote, problem. Okay? You know what? I used to live in L.A. They hadn't fixed their, quote, transportation problem. You get along with it. It's part of living. It's part of timing when you go to work. Yeah, there'll be opportunities to work from home and avoid traffic and technology is going to help and blah, blah, blah. But at the end of the day, you're going to be stuck in traffic if you're going to live in Atlanta. Get used to it. We've got to get over this. The hundred million dollars, a billion dollars that the state legislator is looking at is to fix things, not to improve things. Okay? We've got infrastructure issues on bridges and roads that need repair. We're not putting money in that, in that pipe to double-deck Atlanta. <laughs> okay, it ain't happening. Hopefully MARTA will improve it. If it were me and I were king of the jungle, I'd make public transportation go everywhere, whether you liked it or not. Because if you go to Europe, or you go to the rest of the world, how do they get around? Public transportation. It works great. There's nothing wrong with MARTA. But we got this thing going on. It's a beatdown. It's a psychological beatdown. And it isn't going away. I wish I could give you a more positive, but you know, uh, it all started in 1996. Another one, thank you. Is this yours? Oh, well maybe you had your own microphone. Could be. Uh, but it, it's, it started in 1997. I mean, we, everyone knew this was coming. You know, we're, we're, we're going to 10 million people. Okay, this is LA. We can go all the way to Chattanooga. We can go all the way to Birmingham. We can go all the way to Greenville, okay? And we're going to, because the world's going to start moving here like never before. It's already here, okay? Um, everyone says that the millennials don't want to live in Atlanta. That isn't true. That isn't true at all. Millennials are not going anywhere. There's going to be more moving here. There's going to be more technology jobs, more film and entertainment jobs, more hospitality jobs, and you're going to go where the jobs are. And you're going to go where the good jobs are. Just do yourself one favor. Don't take a job in a place that you think you're going to hate. Yeah. Okay, I see so many young people. I got offered a job in, no offense to you from folks from Detroit. Okay, but I got a job in Detroit. 90 days later, I got to get out of this place. Okay, there's just certain places you can and can't live. I don't know that you want to live in Boston anymore. You know, unless you love snow. You know? But find the place you want to live and find the job you want to work at as opposed to find the job and then I'll figure out where I'm going to live. I think it's backwards. I really do. Questions? What have you been? Do you, do you have any questions? Because no one else wants to ask me a question here. I figured maybe since we were close you would... No. Okay. Oh, no, it's only the students who are allowed to ask questions. How old is student? How they can recognize between the actual and factual problems and issues of business community and what media actually reports? Like we have a slowdown on the West Coast, nobody talked about it for six months, but it's affecting our economy. Yeah. Um, you got to be careful with the media these days. <laughs> I mean, you really do. Um, I'll, I'll tell you straight away. I mean, this is an honest conversation. I'm among friends. We're off the record. <laughs> um, I'm disappointed in a lot of the media. And a lot of it has to do with the way the media has been turned upside down in the last 10 years. 
and a lot of it has to do with the use of technology. Um, the speed to story has become more the order of the day than the quality of the story. So a lot of half-baked information, a lot of erroneous reporting, a lot of erroneous reporting to get more page views and to get more unique visitors. And it's um, questions the credibility of a lot of different companies that are in the media along the way. And I think, frankly, for those stories that are truly important, that you gotta go to multiple media. And if it's a global story, I go over to places like the Financial Times, The Economist, other sources of, of credible content on things that I pay attention to because as I know my international professors know, the way business is portrayed in the United States versus the rest of the world is off. It's way off, way off. I could do a whole day on, on um, perception versus reality of businesses around the world and what's really going on. Okay, and, and I'd love to just do a night on Africa with you because I could. My master's degree is in international business. <laughs> so, I mean, and I find it fascinating, but it's like, it just, it's just so off. The first time I went to uh, Moscow, you know, what I believe Moscow was and what Moscow is was so dramatically different. Seeing is believing. How long was sitting, how, how long was in traffic in Moscow? Uh, you don't sit in traffic, you get out of it and you walk. Because <laughs> it ain't going anywhere. I mean, but uh, I've sat on uh, freeways as recently as last year in Istanbul where they sell literally the people in the middle of the freeway selling chips and water. Because if a car did hit them, the car would get hurt because they wouldn't. Okay? That's how slowly the cars move in Istanbul. Okay? No different in Moscow. So That's I'm telling you. It's like, why do we do this to ourselves when, you know, and the air is so god-awful in Moscow because of these cars that, you know, are diesel and you can die on the fumes before you die getting hit by another car there. You know, it's one of those things. But it is a misperception. You know, uh, but I can give you ten different cities around the world where the media, you know, doesn't either get it right, doesn't correct what they get wrong, okay, have dumbed down the story to the point of the point is missed. And then you have the reality that a lot of media is not objective, it is subjective. Is, is Fox News objective? If you believe in what Fox News is saying, yeah. But it's a point of view. So, you know, the whole conversation we could have on objective versus subjective media, how it's reported, how it's attributed. And, and the funniest part is when you see a story that is erroneous on the flurry to correct. And, and you can't correct a lot of these kinds of mistakes. It's out there and damage has been done. And, and a lot of it is not the truth, if you will. So, in 52 words or less. <laughs> Somebody else? Question? Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. It seems that it's becoming, I don't know, it's difficult to find um, assistance for someone who has an idea to start a small business, excluding franchise, of course, but where do you start and how, what are those, where are those resources? You start with, with right over here <laughs> and, and right over here. You see, you see this one right here? Back to the wall? Uh -huh. You start right there. Okay. That's easy. He teaches entrepreneurship and has for a long time knows what he's talking about. That's the resource that's the beauty of being inside hard learning. Come on. Yes, ma'am. Going back to your about deadlines, how do you handle it when everything is a priority? There is no such thing. There is no such thing. Only in your mind. Only in the mind. Yeah. Every I get like boss. Like, to, like, for instance, I work in a field that, out of a hospital that has over 900 beds, two people, to yeah. purchase for the, oh my. For the pharmacy. <laughs> so everything is like, did you get it done? Mm -hmm. Everything's fine. Are you trying to finish one? And those phone calls coming, so I'm trying to figure out how to joke. Well, I, I, I try to make my deadline, so I don't be like, you're not doing what you're supposed to do. So. You and I should spend some real time together because part of my class deals with prioritization and okay. approval prioritization. Who, whoever you work for, mm -hmm. it should be approving your priority list to the point that you need help. Okay. And when do you get a third person? Mm, not anytime soon. 
Well, I think the education of your boss needs to happen sooner than later. Because <laughs> you're going to burn out. Right. Okay? And, and that does not create a healthy employer. Or, and, and, and so who's going to lose here? Everybody's going to lose. Right. You're going to lose, they're going to lose. Mm -hmm. So if you can at least begin by education and agreeing on priorities, okay. and I, I'm doing what I'm told to do in the order and sequence mm -hmm. that I can get to as fast as I can get to it. Mm -hmm. Did you ever see that... Um, that Lucy uh, with the candy, yeah. that's what you're doing. Yeah. Now, and you can't eat all those bonbons. Have, most of right. these people in this room have not Okay, that. go online. <laughs> I know. But she knew, I, I, I'm talking to my customer here. So all right, for the rest of you, go online and, and Google Lucille Ball. And, then, and there's a video on YouTube, okay, called Candy. Okay? And they're in a candy factory and it's a, it's a, it's a line. And the candy starts moving faster, and, and if they don't put enough candy in each of these bags, they're going to lose their jobs and all that. And they start eating the candy to make sure that the boss doesn't see that, that they're not loading it up the way it should be. That's what you're dealing with. And, and sooner or later, you're going to start eating more candy. Because uh, it didn't go work. But if you take it, it's a big message for every one of you. If you're going to take it, and, and the eventual reality is... I can't do this anymore, okay, and that's what's going to happen, then work backwards. How do I fix the problem? How do I fix the problem? Right. And you move on. Right. But don't prolong there? the inevitable. Yeah. Oh, Lord, have See, they got you into that rote mentality thing. Yeah. It's, it's like traffic. Mm -hmm. I got you believing that I can't get any better than this. Right, that's mm why -hmm. I'm here Exactly. You got to jump out of it, but it's using your good brain to say, I got to solve my problem. It's all a series of problems. Nothing is constant but change. Everything we do can be improved if you want to. Do you have a good software program that can help you with all the proactive? We have a pretty decent software program. It's to the point of saying it's the work, this, you know, constant work. And, you know, we're working out of two different systems, phone calls. Well, on well, the front end, I'm sorry, not hijacking. On the front end and the back end of business, mm -hmm. on the front end, it's the same thing. And the person that your boss doesn't have an understanding of the workload. Mm -hmm. and then on the back end, they're trying to cut expenses so much. That, that's what it is. And yeah. then they naturally assume the worst, that you're mm -hmm. not doing everything you can. Mm -hmm. That's the real problem. Right. Thank you. Sorry. No, that's okay. I just get your choice. Change my mindset. So let me, let me change gears back to, back to my, my millennial buddies. Do you have a plan? Have you ever thought about having a plan? Or are you just going to go to school and then I'll develop the plan after I get out of school? <laughs> I can tell by the body language in the room. I can tell by the body language in the room that, that we got some planning to do. Okay? I would highly encourage you to start a plan. Start a plan. Even if you change it. Even if it's aspirational. Write it down. Get in line with yourself. Start figuring it out. Because you can't get there without a plan. It doesn't just fall into your backyard and, and that's the way it's going to be. So talk about the plan. And, and what is involved in the plan. And if you don't know how to build a plan, talk to him. <laughs> I think it's a very big deal, and I will tell you that most of the millennials that I've been with for the last three or four years don't have a plan. So I caught you on this one. It's one of those things that I saw along the way, that you're focused on grades, and you're focused on finishing. But in the middle of that, there needs to be a plan behind that. Because when you get out, you're going to be graded every day for the rest of your life in a different kind of way. People you work with are going to grade you. People that you work for are going to grade you. Other folks are going to grade you. It's going to be based on when you're driving the car at that point, someone else is not driving the car. And I just think that the, the time spent in process of figuring that out will serve you well long, long term. Time management. Gulp. You hate me for it. Okay, but I'm telling you that time is your enemy. 
I bet I can ask everyone in this room who was just, I'll ask the millennials, you know, how long ago was it when you were 15? It was yesterday. Okay? And you know what? 20 is going to become 30 mighty fast. Time is your enemy. So what are you going to do to take advantage of the time in the course of a day? You can't float. And if you think you can float it, forget it. You're fooling yourself. Questions? I got plenty of these. Yes, ma'am. Um, I actually work for a small business. Um, it's called Big Business Science Exploration. In 2009, it jumped off and it was like skyrocket, great business. And I came around 2013. And while I'm here, it's like they're going through a transitional per um, period from profit to nonprofit. And people are getting laid off, mm -hmm. people are getting burned out and leaving. And I'm wondering, should I stay? <laughs> Do you like what you're doing? I love what I'm doing, and it works with my um, actual plan that I have after college because it gives me experience. It's a nightmare. Do <laughs> um, you like who you're working for? No. Mm. Okay. So how long do you think you're going to like doing what you do and working with someone you don't like? <laughs> yep. that, that's the crossroads for me. Yeah. If you're working in a place like, like that, where you like what you're doing and you like the people you're working for, mm -hmm. I would attempt to hang in. Because I do believe that a lot of folks make a move because it seems like it's greener over there okay. and it's not. Or I'm making a change for the sake of change, mm -hmm. which doesn't make a whole lot of sense. Um, I believe if, if, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing if I wasn't happy and, and continue to like what I do. I'm one of those. I'd, I'd go find another <coughs> job. This life's too short. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and to me, it's all about life, liberty, and the pursuit, the pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. The pursuit of happiness. And that's always moving. And happiness is different for everybody. It's how we're wired. But if it's something that makes you happy, and the environment is good, and you can live happily ever after in a place like that, get past what other people think and what other people do. Be your own person. Don't herd. This is a big one, okay? Uh, I use this visual a lot. Uh, visualize a herd of cows, and then visualize a salmon swimming upstream. Which one do you want to be? You want to be one of the cows in the herd? Or you want to be the salmon that doesn't necessarily go in the same direction as everybody else? And I would challenge all of you to be individuals and not herd. As a demographic group, you herd. You don't date, you go out as a group. You look at, at your whole social networking, it's a pack. Um, I don't think that you should live your life in a pack, unless you're wired for a pack. Okay, if you are, you are who you are and that's the way it is. But if you really want to challenge your thinking and not just move the way everybody else moves, be counterintuitive. Think about it differently. But because if the rest of them are unhappy, that doesn't mean you're unhappy. Paint your own picture. These are your paints. And no one should be able to take them away from you. Paint it the way you want to paint it. So you don't look back and have regrets. The biggest, with my demographic today, my learning experience, is I have many friends who are 60 and miserable. Their career didn't go the way they wanted to. Okay, my doctor. Okay, he hates being a doctor. Okay, it's not the business I got into. I don't get to take care of people. Everything is about numbers and money and blah, blah, blah. And he didn't have another choice. What do you do if you're not a doctor? You pump gas? I mean, what do you do? You know, but why look back one day and say, I wish I would have moved to California. I wish I would have tried something different. I wish I would, I wish I... What do you got to lose? What's the worst thing that could happen to you? You got to get another job? You're not going to starve to death. You got some net that sits underneath there. You got a good brain in your head. You're ready to go to work, go find something else. But the whole regret piece is, is, is getting bigger. You know, unhappy senior citizens who are going to run out of money before they die. There's going to be a lot of them. A lot of them. Is a big regret. They didn't save properly. 
You know, where are you with regard to personal finance? Okay, is that part of your plan? It's got to be. It's got to be. You can't be in debt. You can't let credit rule your world. You got to understand. You got to save your way to prosperity. But you got to do it. So I believe in having a good time. I believe in finding things that make you happy, but at the end of the day, you better have something in your back pocket in, in case you need it along the way. So the whole discussion about personal finance, I'm not sure. I will tell you that my class, I had to have a conversation with the class in personal finance. Because they, they all realized that no one had given them the basic conversation about getting into a discipline early and building your financial strength as you build your professional strength. Write your own ticket. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, what would you say about a company or a corporation that won't allow you to really grow in the company due to your availability? Because I work part-time and I go to school full-time, but I was told I couldn't move up because my availability is not big enough for me. When do you graduate? Uh, 2017. Can you wait it out, or do you not want to wait it out? Because they're not going to change. Yeah, because I like my job, and I want to move up in the company because I see so many issues that can be fixed if people were to do their jobs. And I feel like I could really improve it. Because I'm sure everyone here can relate to Walmart, standing in that line for 20 minutes. <laughs> Believe me, I know, and I've said things, but cashier versus a manager. Yeah, the, the, these, most of these companies, and I'm generalizing them, I don't know the exact situation, but most of these companies will not change their structure, okay? Because that is their structure. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these companies, like Walmart, operate as a bureaucratic, government-like operation, mm -hmm. and they have to. And they have to. Legally, they have to. Um, Bob with your feet. Mm -hmm. They're lost. Sorry. Oh, I, don't know that, I, don't, <laughs> I, I don't know that I agree with you. I know you don't. And How do you know I don't? Well, because uh, if you're saying you know kids shouldn't change jobs, I think... I didn't say kids shouldn't change jobs. Okay. Yeah. I never said that. Sorry. I told her if, if that situation wasn't right, to get out of there. That's not what I said. Okay? Now, why would you tell her not to vote with the feet? Uh, because I don't know her exact situation. But I can, can she I'm wait... I'm not saying to quit uh, before you have another job. Now, always, always have another job. Or maybe I go ahead and finish my education and my opportunity is still with that company and, and I've now gone back to them and said, I did what you told me to do, I want to start moving up now. Option two. But it, that's, that's why I was, I'm not sure I agree with vote with your feet. Well, I, I think be patient can be a strategy that can work as well as don't run, walk. But do you want to hang in? I mean, I've been there almost two years. But do you want to hang in? I think I could is not, yes, I do. <laughs> okay? You need to have the conversation with yourself, and you got to have pros and cons, and you need to make that decision based on some analysis. If you, because the think is always the operative word, no. I, 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 you got to check the box or X the box. Well, see, it goes either way, because one day I'll love my job, and the turnover rate, it just gets over overwhelming too because one day you'll know everyone there the next day you don't know anybody and I've been there almost two years I can count 50 people on the top of my head are you there to make friends no but it's nice to kind of branch out and get to know your co-workers don't worry about your career don't worry about your co-workers that, that, that's that's a business answer okay yes ma'am how are we doing? We're doing good? Everybody all right? Yeah. <laughs> On the flip side of things, I work in a laboratory at CDC, so I try to bring in a lot of, um, a couple of biology kids, I call them, because I'm over 40. And I, if I see potential in them, I invite them to volunteer in the lab to get that internship. But I've run into situations where they start off enthusiastic, but then they get lazy. The thrill is gone. The thrill is gone. So how, how do I, in my position, encourage interns to, like, this is going to matter. And in, with the, in a place like CDC, you can get a 
glowing recommendation, or you cannot. Right. <laughs> I mean, it makes a difference. So how, how can I encourage? Sure. Um, I, I think there are a few things. One is I think you got to sit down with someone that you're going to recommend in advance and have an agreement with them. Okay? Because if they're just doing this on a whim and it's really not where their passion is, then it's an exercise. Is, do, do you really want to do this? Because there, there are 50 behind you that really want to do this. And those are the ones that deserve the opportunity. That's the humanity side of it. I gave you the business side. The humanity side is, is that's not fair. Right. It's not fair to the number two that ought to be the number one because the number one, there was no deal cut. So I think you, you, you cut a deal with, this is, if, if this is, do we agree that this is what you want to do? That you want to at least check it out in a meaningful way and that you're going to do this in a hard-working way because I will not support you because it will make you not look so good mm -hmm. and no one's winning. What's the win-win? And I believe in the win-win. CDC wins if they get a great employee. You win because you made the recommendation. They win because they got to a great place. Can I tell you something funny? Um, I have found that high school students that come for the summer when other high school students are not even thinking about an yeah. internship, but the high school students that come during the summer outperform college students every single That's day. the exceptional group? Those are, oh, sure. 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 Like, and they'll have four internships by the time they get out of school, and they'll yeah. probably keep an A average, and they'll probably have a job because they're wired that way. They're a 10. The question is, do you want to be a, a 5? Do you want to be a 2? What do you want to be on a 1 to 10? There's your 10s. Yeah. And those, those, those few high school kids are jewels, mm -hmm. and they should be nurtured and brought along on a faster track because they are ahead of the ones that are just trying to figure it out and kind of got to their junior year and say, oh my God, I only got one more year, I better figure this out. Doesn't work that way. But I wouldn't be caught up in, in, in recommending people until we shake hands and we agree that you're gonna do A, B, and C before you show up or else I'm gonna be on your case. And that's helping them and that's, that's redirecting them. So at the end of the day, you learn a lot from failure more than you do from victory. So they will learn. If, if one does get bounced, they'll never forget it. You did a good thing. Did you have a question? Well, I'm, I'm in between. I'm over 50, so I'm in between the millennials and the baby things. Boom. So I'm starting my career over again, going back to school. So good. will I. So I'm past the regret stage. So will I have room if I'm up against millennials? Hell yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, and then I'm old. <laughs> I know, but you, you went for your master's. I'm getting the bachelor's. Okay. That's not the point. Okay. The point is, is that mentally, you can hang with them. If your energy level can go, you're there. And people are, are not looking at employees anymore that you're too old and you're too young. They're not doing that anymore. That, that party's over. It really is over. The experience is an important part, but it's a mix. It's millennials and boomers and in between all working together homogeneously. And you're seeing more of it. It's not what it was 10 years ago where I don't want anyone that's over 40 years old because they're old and dumb. They're not. They're, stuck in our way. Well, well that's right. all part of oh, But it's not. It is not that. Okay. You know, and frankly, it's no different than the millennials understand diversity better than any group I've ever seen before. And that's transforming the culture of business, which is a positive thing. So an African-American woman in a different place than you were 10 years ago. Yes, sir. And that's a big step forward. <clears throat> Haven't made as much progress as I believe we should or could, but it is certainly a big step in the right direction. Yes, ma'am. You get the winning last question. <laughs> this has got to be the best question of the <laughs> entire time. No pressure. Uh, that's right. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> um, I just wanted to know, like you say, you, you would like us, like it would be recommended that we do multiple internships. But like most college students, whether you're millennial or older, you always have like a job. 
job, you're in yep. school, and then you're doing multiple internships. Like, how do you manage your time when you're doing all of that? Because eventually, life is not going to care about you or what you have to do. Like, it's going to keep going and going and going. Like, if, if you're in a, a life situation where you don't have time, you just don't have time. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, and that's a decision you make. It's it's where what where are your priorities relative to that 24-hour clock? Okay, it's it's back to the time management discussion. And if you don't have the time to do that, fine. You know what you can do? Go have informational interviews and go talk to companies in industries and categories, in companies that you might you think you might like to work for. So at least gain some intelligence. If you can't commit to a three-month or a six-month internship, the three to six-month internship is better because it's on your resume. They got someone they can talk to as a third party. It shows that you can multitask and do those kinds of things. And equally importantly, your competition's going to have it. Doesn't mean you're not going to get a good job. Okay, it's a it's an edge compared to the ones that don't. But I will tell you that I will look at 50 resumes, the first thing I'm going to look at is work experience. How much do you have? And if you don't have any, I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk to you. You may be the best candidate, but you're not, going to, you're not going to get into my hopper. And I think there are a lot of companies that look at it that way, because we have the advantage of supply. Okay, When the wheel turns and the demand is greater than the supply, then I'm going to take a look at you, because I don't have a choice. But I'm choosing, absolutely categorically choosing. And, and it's a complex proposition now. It's now, in, in recruiting, it's a matter of who you are. And the who is a deep dive. D diving all the way down to looking at, at what you've got going in, 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 on Facebook and coming back the other way. Because they're buying the individual. They're not buying fill the slot anymore. And that's a change in attitude in HR. And that's only happened really in the last four years. But it's about who. In fact, there's a book called Who that talks about that. But anything you can do to get an edge is going to get you to a better place. And the smarter you are, chances are, the more creative you are, you go to a different place if you want to. But again, if you want to. Okay? We do have one last question. She, she, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that was a good question. <laughs> a very good yeah. question. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> trying to rewrite you a little bit. Um, how do you reinvent really yourself? Um, I have worked for a company for like 10 years. For the first maybe six or eight years, it was continual succession, different career. Um, promotions every two years. Well, the company did restructuring within the last mm -hmm. two, three years, and my job was eliminated, and I was told, hey, you can take this or this. So now I am like starting over. I lost my um, seniority. Well, I didn't lose it, but I'm no longer considered a manager. So now, how do I reinvent myself? Because now my resume says, that I have a lesser role, but my previous roles were better roles. So do I eliminate that from my resume or, you know? Because it looks, if you get my resume, you would think that I was um, maybe um, demoted, demoted mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Not knowing that the company restructured and eliminated the positions, the positions across the board. So, you know. I think it's wording. How you word it. I, I, I believe everything should be totally honest. Um, how you word your time with that company, I think, is a story as opposed to title, title, title. So when they start out, they're reading a story. I've worked for this company for 16 years. I've done this, 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 and this, and my current role is this. It doesn't say anything about. I got demoted and I took a lower paying job. It's honest. And I think it, the explanation really needs to get to the point of a conversation. A resume is just to get you in that door for that conversation. It's not to close a deal. And if you look at it that way, cover letter should be what's in it for them. The resume should be what you're all about that you can bring to them. 
And if they, their curiosity is piqued, all you want to do is get in the door and dance. And dancing is a whole different deal than explaining. Thank you all. Well, we have a small token of appreciation for Mr. Baker. It says, in appreciation of your commitment, time, and willingness in sharing your knowledge and expertise with the students, faculty, and staff at Clayton State University. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you. I would just like to also thank the SunTrust Foundation and the representative Doug Hickman, who has sponsored part of the Dean's Lecture Series. So, so again, thank you.